Francis Levy, Edna Hessian, and I are co-directors of the Philip Teddy Center, and welcome to the Politics and Psychobiology of War. Uh, I wanted to mention that in tandem with this particular roundtable, our film series continues tomorrow with a showing of Stanley Kubrick's Full Metal Jacket. So that's at 3 o'clock, I believe, right? Yep. So uh, please come to that. And then next week, the aggression series continues with the politics and psychobiology of genocide. Uh, I wanted to call your attention to the art show, Typographica, and I think this will be the last Saturday this will be up because we have a, a, another art exhibit going up that's related to this whole aggression series, a very powerful art exhibit. But this one is uh, Typographica, and, and, and if you look in back right there, those are the calligraphic works of uh, Eleanor Holland, and in the other room, we have Chris Calderwood's kind of semi-installation there. And these are photographs of graffiti by Alexander Norbaum. And lastly, the work of Elaine lustig Cohn. So please take a look at those. Now, uh, lastly, I wanted to first of all thank our media sponsors, the Leon Levy Foundation and Shelby White, and Jonathan Estridge, and our roundtable sponsors, the Wunsch Foundation, and Mary Lou Allen. Uh, and again, to remind you that we are, uh, the, the financial crisis for Philip Tatis has not passed, uh, nor has it unfortunately passed elsewhere. But uh, if you're interested in any aspect of our programs, from videography to our journal to dialogue to our research program to our film program to our music program, you can target a contribution towards that and, and become involved with us in that. There are some people who are volunteering their time to work with us on grant writing now. It's a week-by-week -week thing, and we're really intent on keeping this, what we consider, gem of New York cultural life alive and kicking. So uh, we're going to fight. We're not, we're not down. We're, co we're going to continue. Uh, so now I'm very pleased to introduce John Horgan. John Horgan is a science journalist and director of the Center for Science Writings at the Stevens Institute of Technology in Hoboken, New Jersey. A former senior writer at Scientific American, he's also written for the New York Times, Time, Discover, the London Times, and other publications around the world. He blogs for the Center for Science Writings and for Blogging Heads TV and writes a column, The Last Word, for BBC Knowledge Magazine. His books include The End of Science, The Undiscovered Mind, and Rational Mysticism. And by the way, some of these books uh, will be on sale. We had a little snafu because there's another John Horgan whose book is on sale also. But, right. but, but some, so we have a few books on, on, on sale afterwards. And, and I also want to parenthetically say that uh, all Philotetes programming, or a good part of it, is still being streamed and is available in our archives. If you go to past programming, you'll be able to see, like, see this particular program later this week simply by going to past programming. Uh, so where was I? His awards include the Science Journalism Award of the American Association for the Advancement of Science and the National Association of Science Writers in Society Award. John Horgan will introduce our other guests and moderate this afternoon's event. Thanks, John. Thank you. And um, thanks for all coming out. This is a great turnout for uh, such a depressing topic on a really nice day. So um, first of all, about, the, uh, about my credentials, uh, I checked the website of Philoctetes a week ago, and it had the bio of John Horgan, the Irish psychologist who wrote a book called The End of Terrorism. Now, I'm sure he would have been fine in this format, but in my defense, I am, uh, as a, uh, an amateur, I am much less constrained by actual knowledge than he would have been. So everything should be just fine. Um, all right, so I'm just going to read the biographies of the uh, panel members, and then we'll try to get things going. David Blight is class of 1954 professor of American history at Yale University, where he also serves as director of the Gilder Lehrman Center for the Study of Slavery, Resistance, and Abolition. During the 2006 and 7 academic year, he was a fellow at the Dorothy and Lewis B. Cullman Center for Writers and Scholars at the New York Public Library. Blight is the author of A Slave No More, Two Men Who Escaped to Freedom, including their narratives of emancipation and race and reunion, the Civil War and American memory. R. Brian Ferguson is professor of sociology and anthropology at Rutgers University in Newark. He is an anthropo anthropological generalist on the subject of war, with publications on tribal warfare, 
Ethnic Conflict, the Archaeology of Violence and War in Ancient States. He is a critic of theories purporting to explain war as a result of evolved propensities to kill. His books include Yanomami Warfare, A Political History, and War in the Tribal Zone, which he co-edited with Neil Whitehead. Dory Laub is a psychoanalyst and physician in New Haven, Connecticut, who works with victims of psychic, tra psychic trauma and their children. Dr. Laub is clinical professor of psychiatry at the Yale University School of Medicine and co-founder of the Fortunoff Video Archive for Holocaust Testimonies. He obtained his MD at the Hadassah Medical School at Hebrew University in Jerusalem, Israel, and his MA in clinical psychology at the Bar Ilan University in Ramat Gan, Israel. He has served as acting director of the Genocide Studies Program and is deputy director for trauma studies at Yale. Dr. Laub has published on the topic of psychic trauma in a variety of psychoanalytic journals and has co-authored a book entitled Testimony, Crisis of Witnessing in Literature, Psychoanalysis, and History with Professor Shoshana Fellman. So why don't we just applaud the panel members right now. Um, I'm, I'm very flattered to be in such uh, eminent company. So I'd like to get things started um, by putting a question to the audience that has obsessed me over the past, well, really a couple of decades, but in increasingly since 9-11 uh, and then the invasion of Iraq. And uh, I'll put it to you, and then I, I hope it can be sort of looming over the discussion that we have here this afternoon. So the question to you, and I actually want a uh, show of hands, and you don't get to ask me questions to clarify what I mean by this. Will humans ever stop fighting wars once and for all? And I don't mean uh, stopping if we all are killed. That doesn't count. <laughs> so will humans ever stop fighting wars once and for all? So who want what, one hand? What? Yes or no? Oh, I'm sorry, yes or no. Uh, will they? That, so raise your hand if you think they will. Abstain. Abstain? OK. So that's one, two, three, four, five, six. So I'd say there must be 70 people in this room, maybe. And we had six or seven hands. That's pretty typical. I actually expected a more optimistic audience. Um, intellectual New Yorkers, I thought you'd be a little more dovish and, and uh, upbeat about uh, the future. But this is pretty much what I've gotten whenever I've carried out this survey, various places around the world with various different kinds of audience, audiences. To me, this is a really extraordinary fatalism. And, um, and I like to try to bring data to bear on uh, this whole. Um, it's a question I hope we can return to. But I want to get things started by giving uh, each panel member a quote from somebody in their discipline. And I want them to uh, react to it. So I'm actually going to start with uh, Brian Ferguson. You'll recognize this, Brian. In his 1996 book, Demonic Males, uh, Richard Wrangham, who's a very prominent anthropologist at Harvard who studies uh, chimpanzees in the wild primarily. He said this, chimpanzee-like violence proceeded and paved the way for human war, making modern humans the dazed survivors of a continuous five million year habit of lethal aggression. Do you agree with that comment? No, <laughs> I do not agree with that comment. Um, it's one. There are many comments like that, both from Rangham, people who work with Rangham, from other people for decades uh, who have asserted that there is some kind of inbred tendency for people or males to kill members of other groups. I don't think it's true for chimpanzees. I'm working on a book called Chimpanzees in War. I think uh, there are ha have been instances among chimpanzees of what I think could be classified as warfare, members of one group uh, attacking and killing members of the other group. Um, but these are very unusual events. Um, they are events where I've identified major disruption 
of the chimpanzees by human activity in the area. They're also from a very few periods which also demonstrate other kinds of violence which couldn't be called adaptive at all. Uh, killing and eating their own infants, for example, killing human infants, killing males and females within their or males within their own group. So, no for chimpanzees, uh, no for the concept that something could have evolved in a common ancestor six million years ago and been passed along unchanged through six million years, which doesn't make any sense in evolutionary terms and goes against lots of evolutionary findings, such as reduction in canine dimorphism or reduction in. Uh, a reduction in canine size rather in male-female dimorphism in, in the homonym line, which is associated with lower aggression. Doesn't make sense in the archaeological record, which despite opinions to the contrary, is pretty much uh, against the idea of war uh, until you begin to develop more larger societies, uh, more hierarchy, um, other factors too. Uh, not consistent with the record of hunters and gatherers we can see around the world. And I think bottom line is totally unhelpful in trying to understand wars that we actually experience today, like the ones we're involved in now. Where do you go with that idea? Uh, is that going to help you understand what's going on? Or rather, as I think, is that going to be a kind of a smokescreen to keep you from looking at what might explain what's going on? Okay. Um, thanks. By the way, I, I think the way that these discussions are supposed to work is that it's basically the only rule is that there are no rules so we can interrupt each other at uh, well you guys can all be try to be polite but interrupt each other at any time and we can go off on digressions and uh, so forth that's definitely something I want to come back to the, the sort of prehistory and biology of war but David I'm going to turn to you next and uh, give you a quote that again you might um, recognize um, in his book, On the Origins of War, the Yale historian Donald Kagan, I guess he's emeritus now, uh, remarks that, quote, over the past two centuries, the only thing more common than predictions about the end of war has been war itself. Uh, now I'm paraphrasing. He dismisses disarmament efforts as naive and advocates maintaining peace through military strength. He contends that, quote, War is probably part of the human condition and likely to be with us for some time to come. So from your perspective mm -hmm. as an historian, how do you react to that, that quote? Well, um, Kagan is my colleague, although he's retired. <laughs> um, and ironically, I would say I think I essentially agree with him. Um, it's very hard as a student of history to disagree with that. Generation after generation, culture after culture, nation after nation. Um, uh, the, the, only, the only hope I would, in, in, I would suggest, and even in response to your opening universal question, and it's, it's an odd, horrible kind of hope in a way, is that there are examples we all know there are examples of societies rendered essentially pacifist by war. Now, it's a, it's a gross generalization to say that all Germans are now pacifist or all Japanese are now pacifist, but they are two of the most pacifist cultures in the world. We might oddly take a bit of hope from that idea that in some cultures that have experienced war at its absolute total, at its absolute worst, we have seen generations grow with stern pacifist views. I remember being in a, in a discussion. Uh, the year I spent in, uh, teaching in Munich, uh, I went to the, G the German National Historical Convention that they have. This is all the German historians who do any kind of history. And there were several sessions on World War II. Watching German historians debate World War II was, was an interesting education. And afterward, uh, Ernest May from Harvard, a great diplomatic historian, there was a lot of foreign policy people and foreign policy historians there. And I remember hearing a distinguished German historian say to all the rest of us, especially us Americanists, uh, Americans, he said, never again shall a German shoulder a rifle in the world. And Frankly, we challenged him because this was 1992 or 93 during the Bosnian War. 
thousands upon thousands of Bosnian refugees were streaming into Germany. Germany was taking more refugees from the Balkans than any, any country in the world. And yet they weren't yet engaged with NATO. And here were these American historians, but wait a minute, why aren't the Germans in, in Bosnia fighting? And suddenly we were, we were having this debate over why are Germans so pacifists? As though we shouldn't have known that. I mean, we we're all staying in Munich after all. Um, so, I, I, but, but I think Kagan's essentially right. I mean, um, look, at the end of the Cold War, uh, we, we thought we had a new Pax, uh, uh, if not a Pax Americana, a Pax of some kind in the world, uh, only to discover that the end of the Cold War bred all kinds of wars waiting to happen. Um, and why, why were we surprised? Now, I, now I'm, not, I'm not ready to, I mean, I'm, I'm surely not going to debate and the, the, the sort of primal origins of this because I'm not a student of that. Um, but it does seem to me that uh, we, we fool ourselves. Uh, Albin Tourje, uh, one of my favorite writers of the late 19th century and whom I studied intensively in my book on Civil War memory said, only fools forget the causes of war. Uh, in Thucydides, if you read Thucydides carefully enough, you find those nuggets that and that's what Kagan, of course, has spent his life studying, the Peloponnesian War. If you read Thucydides, you find those nuggets where Thucydides says, he, there's a section where Thucydides is discussing not just war, this 20-some year civil war that he's writing about, but he's talking about the plagues and the poverty that came of it. And he says the problem here is that the people always make their, their memories fit in, no, their recollections fit in with their sufferings. And as long as we recollect the last war, um, we're probably preparing for another. Uh, that, that, that's a horrible fact. Um, but uh, I, 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 I don't know how else to conclude on that question. So I, I, I'm saying ironically I'd agree with Don Kagan because politically I don't think I agree on much of anything with him. Um, <laughs> but that's, that's neither here nor there and he wouldn't care. Uh, <laughs> Um, thank you. I, you probably want to go back to that last comment that he just made uh, about um, remembrance and how that can fuel the next war. Do you want to do that now or do you want... Okay. Yeah. What is the alternative? <clears throat> I think that uh, basically when you do not recollect, mm -hmm. you prepare for the next, next war because Mm -hmm. Something still remains and remains at work, mm -hmm. even though consciously not recollecting. It's a question of uh, what shape, what gestalt you give your recollections. Mm -hmm. And it's so absolutely different uh, the recollections of uh, Germans and Japanese mm -hmm. versus the recollections of, of suffering, of other sufferings which prepare war. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I'm all for recollecting, mm -hmm. but not in the direction of myth-making. You do never know what you'll find when you're collecting. I think I'm working with testimony for years. And to begin with the tabula rasa, I do not know what to expect. Yeah. And, and it evolves. So to create a safe space for recollection is very important, not to politicize it, mm -hmm. not to uh, cut it short, mm -hmm. to allow it, to, pro to protect it. To, I think that can also be a safeguard against war. Mm -hmm. Okay, now I've got a quote for you. Um, civilization and its discontents. One of the finest pieces of pessimistic writing I've ever read. Uh, Freud warns that aggression, quote, forms the basis, aggression, forms the basis of every relation of affection and love among people, with the single exception, perhaps, of the mother's relation to her male child. That's one quote. Actually, I would dispute even that exception. Um, given my upbringing. All right. Uh, Freud adds that it is, quote. You have it the other way around, though. Oh, right. It, it works both ways, actually. Uh, Freud adds that it is, quote, always possible to bind together a considerable number of people in love so long as there are other people left over to receive the manifestations of their aggressiveness. Well, my first reaction is a very pregnant quote. 
Um, it's too close. You know, I think uh, if uh, this was written uh, after World War One, I, I think in the 1920s, um, I think we've come a very long way since to uh, make it much more subtle and differentiated. Mm -hmm. When you say we, you mean uh, the psychoanalytic the, the tradition? Psychotic tradition? The uh, psychoanalytic tradition is having an impact on societal thinking. Um, that there is, uh, there are aggressive impulses, absolutely. Mm -hmm. That they shape uh, uh, decisions, they shape life, absolutely. Except they inevitably are uh, fused with loving. Uh, uh, and sometimes uh, not only fused, but really in the service of loving, uh, so the uh, loving uh, urges. So therefore, there's more power, there's more initiative. Mm -hmm. So it's mostly the other way around. I mean, it's the mastery of the aggressive instinct. Freud came to call it eventually the death instinct mm -hmm. by the uh, libidinal, by the loving instinct. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, I, I think any kind of generalization can be suspect. Right. I think we need to go to case by case. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the quote alerts me, puts me on, on, on uh, makes me watchful, but not, doesn't necessarily determine where I want to go. Thank you. All right. Um, I'd like another question that responds to something. Can I say, Pardon? Something? Yes. Can I, oh, absolutely. Yeah, to Brian, I love the smoke screen. Concept. The smoke screen is like a, and this is, applies to, every, to many of the quotes, it's a theory and it simplifies things and we all of a sudden think we understand. And we don't. There are many of the theories about war, about uh, tribal wars, about, I think that uh, theories can guide us for a certain distance. Mm -hmm. We have to be ready to discard them and to listen into, uh, into experience the actual data. So yes, a smokescreen can be very uh, 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 smokescreen cover that covers everything. New. And just to follow up on that, if I might, is that this is one of my problems with many of the different bio biologistic theories of why humans make war, is that they don't do what you said. They don't pursue, they don't have clear hypotheses and pursue data that could either support or refute the theory. Uh, they ignore critics. And this has been my experience for now 25 years writing against these. They just won't respond when you show something's wrong. They talk to each other. They talk to the public. The public finds this a very congenial idea because it's very simple. Why do we have these problems? It's our nature. End of story. You've been reassured. Go along with your life. But if you look at it in terms of theory, if you try to actually say, what are they saying here? Uh, what is the evidence for it? Those things don't go very far at all. And perhaps within that discipline, that methodology, it cannot go further. Mm -hmm. In order to understand the phenomenon, you need to open the door for other uh, specialist mm -hmm. methodologies, for other uh, disciplines. Mm -hmm. And then you begin to understand only an interdisciplinary, composite, methodological approach. Yes. Just a clarification. You are not saying that the fact that humans need to have aggression mm -hmm. is what leads to war eventually. Or are you saying that? No, no. Uh, I, when you look at uh, work on uh, evolution, um, we hear a lot about aggression and we hear about competition, but there's a great deal more work that shows that affiliation and cooperation and altruism are foundations of other primates in human societies. That doesn't get the same kind of attention. If you look at chimpanzee warfare, if you want to call it that, the warfare is predicated on a highly developed cooperative uh, ability. Um, so warfare between chimp groups, one group attacks another, you could say is an aggressive act. Um, but when you look at why it happens as an express, if you suggest that why it happens is that there's some kind of innate aggression that has to come out, I don't see that in the evidence. I see there's a cooperative basis. That's the way chimpanzees and humans live. And with the proper circumstances and culture or traditions to talk about chimpanzees, this can lead to violent aggression between different groups. But I don't think it's a result of individual impulses somehow coming together into a collective action. I think collective actions, groups form up 
in conflicts. And as they form up in conflicts, uh, the proper aggressive attitude is elicited through various kinds of microprocesses that's then directed at others. But to say it's the individual impulses towards aggression that somehow generate war is uh, putting the cart before the horse, I think. Well, then, uh, you know, the, one of the questions I have is what uh, the behavior of chimpanzees and uh, monkeys or even hunter-gatherers really has to do with modern warfare. So you know, Donald Rumsfeld and Dick Cheney and George Bush are making the decision to go to, to war, and they're not being put in harm's way themselves. Mm -hmm. And then war is this gigantic logistical and political exercise. I mean, it, it, it seems to me that there's a pretty big discontinuity between uh, that and um, you know a, a small group of chimpanzees going and beating the hell out of another troop uh, in a neighboring uh, area. Agreed. So. Well, the chimps don't write their history. Humans do. <laughs> I mean, and I don't mean that to be flippant. Uh, uh, we are the only species, so far as we know, that I, I mean, other species have memories. Yeah. God knows. They do amazing things in flocks and so forth. But we're the only species, so far as we know, that writes its own history and knows it writes its own history and consciously looks to the past to live in the present and therefore this idea of whatever, revenge or retribution or um, memory. Uh, if, you, know, you know the old bromide, if we could all just forget for half a century, we might get a half a century without war. Uh, but I mean, th th this, is th this is one great discontinuity. I mean, if, if, if all we do is, bi I mean, I think I'm with you on this. If all we do is biologize this problem of warfare, then God, what we're leaving out. Well, I would go a little further saying it. Material it, conditions, it, politics, on and yeah. on and on. <laughs> I, I think that, that, that biologizing is a red herring. I think it, it, it detracts attention away from things that we should be looking at. Mm -hmm. um, so I would go, I'm with you, but I would go further than that. I don't think it helps us. And, and chimpanzees don't, you know, they don't write history, but they do live history. And this is something I think mm -hmm. uh, hasn't been appreciated in people who are studying chimpanzees in the field or people who study hunters and gatherers or, or tribal peoples, that they do have an experience change over time and their memories. Uh, chimpanzees definitely have memories that have led to uh, violence. Mm -hmm. So they're, writing history and, and living history are two different things. Mm -hmm. And we tend to think that only literate people live history somehow because yeah. they're the ones who write it. Mm -hmm. But history is there for chimps as well as people. Uh, I'm still not clear. Uh, two things. One, I don't know exactly what you mean biologizing because mm -hmm. I, I mean we cannot be without biology. Mm -hmm. And the second is, uh, how would you explain, and don't you think there is any relationship between formation of gangs mm -hmm. and then eventually wars? Okay. Um, biologizing first uh, is something, to put a point on it, the idea that we have some kind of evolved predisposition that makes us want to kill members of other groups. This is what you find as the common thread running through many different approaches. That's what I call biologizing war. Yeah, I mean, I was thinking before we came here, you know, how, how do you draw a line between psychology and biology in a meaningful sense? And I don't want to try and do that. Or, you know, or Freud's death wish and Lorenz's ideas of an uh, innate aggressive drive, you know, which is psychological, which is biological. But I don't try. But the idea that there's evolved propensity to kill members of other groups, that's the theory that keeps coming up, that's what I say is without support. Now, if you want to talk about gangs and, um, and war, I mean, my other area of research is the development of organized crime in New York City. So I've been studying street gangs from the 19th century, not so much current ones, but uh, the history of street gangs. Uh, it's a very interesting phenomena there. And I think that there is a, uh, a uh, an association, but not the one most people would think. When you get street gangs in the 19th century, uh, and this is where the film Gangs of New York was all wrong, the formation of these, other than the inchoate groups that are hanging out in the corner, but the formation of actually defined group with leaders that can be put into a task to do something against some other group, is a top-down process by political leaders. That's the way they come about. Also comes about later on after Prohibition when there's a seismic shift when the gangsters 
uh, themselves get the upper hand over the politicians. Before it was the politicians who had the upper hand. The continuity uh, is that when you find ethnic groups going out and killing each other, seemingly because of these ancient atavistic hatreds and memories, invariably you find politicians in the top who are organizing them to go out and do that and invoking some kind of created or constructed historical memory. So yeah, there is a continuity, but I think the continuity is wrong if you think that this is something that comes out of a, a natural tendency to make a group of us versus them, and that applies across the board. The us versus them is something that's created and manipulated in situations. Dory, I, yes. uh, you must want to say something. Yeah. We were talking a little bit uh, in the uh, green room, which isn't actually green. Not green at uh, all. About uh, never revenge uh, as a motive for warfare. And it seems that the larger issue might be sort of emotion versus reason as a motive for war. So, but I wonder if you could address why it seems that uh, in some regions people are able to sort of forgive and forget or at least not perpetuate the cycle of revenge, whereas in others um, it goes on for generation after generation. Uh, let me first pick up on the us versus them. Mm -hmm. And I think that may be at the root of many of the violent conflicts. It's the issue of otherness. And can we have a way of experiencing and thinking where otherness has a place? And in many systems of thought, where those approaching fundamentalism mostly, but not only, the otherness is not tolerated. Mm -hmm. There has to be a replication of the same. And one way of uh, addressing otherness is be when you do not tolerate it. It's a totalitarian system, it's a Hanarian kind of thought mm -hmm. system, is to eliminate it. And I think uh, probably Nazi Germany or Hutus have this model of even uh, invented otherness to completely uh, obliterate it. Now, why? Uh, I think that the notion of revenge, in my opinion, is a little too um, uh, logical. Uh, it's a rationalization to some extent. I think the, uh, the, we, we live history, not only that the one that we read, uh, write and read, and uh, history inhabits us. And uh, without quite mastering it, knowing it, recollecting it, there's a, a tendency to go over it again and again, whether it's traumatic nature to try and master it. And history has a way of propagating itself into the present. Whether and it's written or not. Whether it's written or not. I didn't mean to imply that. And I mean, and much every culture it, has yes. a story. Much of it can be, never be known and never be written consciously, but propagates itself. And I think in places in which its uh, history is worked through, is dealt with, is known, it probably creates a buffer against uh, its repetition. And uh, when it's uh, completely uh, dismissed, um, it continues it, exerting its unconscious pressure. You know, I would just uh, 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 comparing, for example, countries like uh, Germany and uh, Lithuania. Uh, Germany has uh, slaved under the, its history and tried to elucidate it and ad infinitum. Maybe creating the extreme pacifist who indirectly promoted the killing because they didn't say no to it or didn't kill, didn't kill the killer in the first place. Uh, I think in, in a country like Lithuania, there's absolutely no acknowledgement of the, the collaboration and the mass killing and so forth. And uh, to me, this is a danger. And maybe this obliquely addresses the question where in some uh, situation it continues the, uh, the cycle and others not. I just don't call it revenge. Yeah. Revenge is a nice uh, rationalization. OK, thanks. Um, so now I wanted to uh, pick up on something that was in the description of this program that I found pretty extraordinary. I'll just read it. Um, it says that uh, even as the craft of war occupies an ever-expanding portion of the world's material and intellectual resources, military science has yielded breakthroughs 
that have benefited large populations, particularly in the area of medicine. This is just one of the ways in which the aggressive impulse can act simultaneously as a force for destruction and as an agency for self-preservation. So the idea is that there are benefits to war. And I just want to read uh, two uh, quotes from famous intellectuals that make this uh, claim even more dramatically. So Kant, Manuel Kant, uh, wrote that too much peace engenders, quote, cowardice and effeminacy and tends to degrade the character of the nation. Now, this is interesting because Kant also wrote a famous essay called Perpetual Peace, which was about how to move past the war era. So obviously he was a little ambivalent about uh, war, but not ambivalent in this statement. Uh, de Tocqueville asserted that, quote, war almost always enlarges the mind of a people and raises their character, uh, unquote. Uh, there are lots of examples of this kind of uh, thinking from people from whom you wouldn't expect it. So I guess the question, I'll start with you, David, is um, William James also in the uh, world equivalent of war. Right. I had a whole beginning section where he talked about sort of the nobility of the military character and so forth. And, I just, and, and that a progressive nation needs a moral equivalent of war. Yeah. Yes. The great William James, my hero. Yes, he said that. Uh, well, first of all, I mean, Kant and Tocqueville are late 18th, early 19th century writers. They're writing in a world, it seems to me, their world, that assumed that 19th century was a century of progress, that humankind had all this potential for betterment, and that war was, you know, was, was you get waylaid with war, but, but human society, I mean, they're not 20th century people. They hadn't lived to see the First World War, the Second World War, the 20th century. Uh, now, that's one response to that, but, but we don't want to lay this all the counter Tocqueville's feet or anybody else's. I mean, there's so many important writers have said this. I mean, the, so many cultures among its highest intellectuals have, have argued this, that, that, that war chastens, war builds, war creates community, war creates camaraderie of men, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. P apart from all that technological advancement to which we could discuss, you know, internet and interstate highways and all those wonderful things that came out of World War II. But uh, there, there's, there's an ancient, well, let's just say there's a long tradition in the modern world uh, of arguing that that war has. Uh, where would literature be without war? I mean, I could go on and on about this. I mean, I'm, I'm, how, how many of our greatest writers, you know, it wouldn't be a Faulkner without the Civil War, um, and on and on and on. Now, that's not an argument for war, um, <laughs> by any means. Um, but we've got to be careful with the slope on that one because. Um, uh, it, 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 even if war is not a natural condition of humankind, it has been an in, a, a constant of human history. And therefore, it isn't surprising to me at all that the most brilliant people in any culture would be attracted to this idea. In fact, while I'm on that, uh, my good friend Drew Faust, whom you know primarily as the president of Harvard now, uh, the beleaguered president of Harvard, is also a very good historian. And before she published her recent book on death in the American Civil War, she wrote a lovely, lovely little essay, that didn't mean the pun, for a conference a whole bunch of us Civil War historians were at, and the, the title of it was Why We Love the Civil War. It was an ironic title. But she, she spun this very interesting argument about what it is in our culture, and a lot of us have written about this in one way or another. What is it in, our, in American culture? that attracts so many hundreds of thousands, if not millions, it, not just men, you know, who love board games and like to reenact, but what is it about that American Civil War that is so attractive, that causes so much nostalgia, so much popular, why do we love this? I think the answers are, are partly in, instinctive, I suppose, but they're also cultural and political. They come out of a process of history that has rendered such a ghastly, we, we do it with the world wars. Um, we, we, we render World War II into a, a subject of a kind of popular culture nostalgia in some, just look in bookstores. Um, so, you know, uh, 
the, 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 the love of war sells, but love of war is also a serious subject we shouldn't ignore. Mm. Thank you. Would you like to the the yeah. the sort of upside of war? If you know it, not the upside. <laughs> okay. But this sort of relief, the illusion of relief that war can provide. Mm. I think in a moment of in, uh, very much stalemated conflict and um, sort of crisis and uh, an enormous ambivalence when no movement is possible, it's sort of tempting to, be, to feel that war will solve it. Mm. Just, everything will be externalized, it will play itself out there, the enemy. And, so yes, there can be a certain positive valence to war, particular in moments in which it's uh, uh, not, not working. Mm -hmm. um, maybe you could mention, I'm going to throw the question at you, it seems to me that when you're talking about the upside of war, you have to mention something like social Darwinism, mm -hmm. uh, which saw war as a process of sort of culling out unfit societies, and that, that idea was pretty popular in the late 19th century. Um, well, so does anybody in biology think that way? Any respectable biologists think that way anymore? They wouldn't call it that. Um, the, some of the, the terminology, in-group amity, out-group enmity, which is current in um, uh, evolutionary psychological or sociobiological literature, comes from it's either Sumner or Spencer. Uh, it's straight from social Darwinism. And the idea that there is this, this, this constant struggle between groups and some triumph over the others and over time it leads to uh, larger and somehow better by virtue of having been victors, <laughs> groups, um, that's still there. Um, but they wouldn't, they would shy away from other things. They wouldn't call themselves social Darwinists. Mm -hmm. So is that where? Yeah. And on the idea of uh, you know how would we get along without war, which is something that Ardry asks and Lorenz asks, and I, I've just been reading them again from one of my classes. So it's you know, how how would he survive without war? Remind everybody who they are. Robert Ardry uh, was a, a screenwriter, a successful screenwriter. He wrote. Uh, cartoon starring Charlton Heston, for example, um, and he wrote a series of books called um, *The Territorial Imperative* and *African Genesis*, which basically became the, uh, uh, among other things, the model for the film *2001*. People might remember that it was taken straight from Robert Ardrey. The, the sort of ape men uh, at the beginning, yeah. and then there's one who grabs a bone and. Beats another, it beats another ch chimp-like creature to death. Yes, right. and then throws it up in the air, and it becomes a space station. So that's the beginning of civilization. Yeah. Tool making Isn't technology. Welch on that too, I think. Uh, <laughs> unfortunately not. She uh, was in space. Oh, that was a different one. Oh. She could have been used in that. <laughs> I poster on my. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you can keep it there in your mind if Long it works. That's right. Um, but I mean, the whole idea there, uh, which he got from Lorenz, Conrad Lorenz, was a German ethologist, uh, won Nobel Prize for the study of uh, social behavior of animals. Um, not as uh, as as uh, uh, dramatic, perhaps, as Ardry, but uh, on the same wavelength. These are both in the 1960s, and this is what helped spur get this this anthropological study of war going to refute them. But the whole idea of the film 2001 is taken straight from Ardry, which is once you learn to kill, all the other progress begins. But as in the film 2001, it leads to the point where we're able to kill ourselves off completely. And so what's not in Ardry is a black obelisk from outer space. That's to take humans to the next stage of evolution. But it was, it was this killer instinct, the killer ape, uh, that's responsible for all our progress. When you look at um, history, you certainly don't see that. When you look at uh, tribal warfare, I mean, one of the things that they say, it's kind of in, in the abstract for this, that the quest for an improved weapon system uh, is a, a human obsession. Well, not if you look at the archaeological record when weapons stay the same for thousands or tens of thousands of years without modification. Um, and then, you know, there is a, a process of modification that occurs, and there's a, like a social universe of people who upgrade to a new kind of weapon system. Um, 
But focusing all your energy on developing new weapon system, no. Uh, the idea that civilization comes out of war, very contestable. Um, you look at the development of ancient Egypt, which used to be thought done by conquest now. Egyptologists are saying it was more of a game of monopoly. You look at the development of Mesopotamian civilization, Chinese civilization along the, the Yellow River. Uh, even Rome uh, in its early years are, are not the kind of militaristic uh, conquests that are later projected back in time by militaristic societies. Um, it doesn't lead to those things, but militarism comes along and then everything is due to war. It's what we anthropologists call a myth charter, uh, which is what Ardry is too. You know, this is the way it's always been. This is what gave us our civilization. This is where progress comes from. How would we get along without it? Uh, we'd be condemned, like Ardry says of gorillas, to a life of endless munching. Um, <laughs> because they, they're, they're not killers. It doesn't sound so bad. Yeah. Um, and, and that's what we'd be. You know, we'd just be these weak, Purposeless. Now, certainly, war provides a uh, you know darn good reading. Um, you know, but so does fighting a giant shark. You know, you need a you need a dramatic event, and peace uh, is not as dramatic. Can I, yes, please. You know, this whole uh, notion of the uh, gains from war, I fail to see one single gain from World War One. If half of the men, I think, died of non-war-related causes mm -hmm. of influenza. There wasn't that much advance even in medicine. Right. You can say that World War II, at least, the beast was contained. Mm -hmm. It stopped something very destructive. But for World War One, there's, there's nothing that I think was gained. Well, that could be a... a well, the understanding mm -hmm. of uh, trauma, psychological trauma, uh, by Freud was very much connected yeah. to First World, World War. You know, I'm, I'm not prepared to say war is, in, is instinct, because I don't know. Uh, but I do wonder if, and I'm saying wonder here, if we are not in some way hardwired for certain kinds of stories. Um, um, uh, epic, for example. I mean, I can't prove this, mm -hmm. but uh, are, are we hardwired for certain kinds of narrative? And now, narrative and story is, of course, culture-based, but uh, are, are we hardwired, especially in Western cultures, uh, for redemptive narratives, uh, for an, for, to make war into something aesthetically redemptive, you know? Uh, and, <laughs> however ghastly and meaningless World War I was, mm -hmm. You can't figure out a reason for it by 1916, 17, 18, uh, and yet it just kept going on. And it produces this profound poetry and literature and so on and so forth. Uh, not much of it redemptive, uh, but, but in America in particular, and again, I'm not ready to generalize that this is only American, but, but are we sometimes almost hardwired for the stories that war has given us about conflict? about the test, about the ultimate test. How many journalists have gone abroad as war correspondents? There's such a tradition of this. Who've never been to war before. They're not, they would never consider themselves warlike, but they absolutely fall head over heels. If not in love with war, they can't resist it. De De Dexter Filkin's recent memoir of Iraq, I found, it was remarkable. It read so much like um, Michael Hare's dispatches from the Vietnam War and many other journalistic treatments of war by war correspondents. They find it terrible but beguiling as a story. Mm -hmm. It's the best story they ever covered, right? But best beat they ever had. Uh, so I, we, we, we've got to think about that because we're the audience. May yes, I? please. Okay, journalists have a story. Yeah, inherently but, they have to have but, one. And they share it with the public. But that's the journalist story. Yes. And here I would like to come back to the question about revenge. Hey, look, the part of the story can be ancient uh, ethnic uh, hatreds and revenge. What the fa in fact we see is the major, the mass atrocities didn't bring about revenge. Uh, there was no revenge in Rwanda, no mass revenge, not in the Holocaust. Cambodia. Not in Cambodia, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Including some, what it led to is uh, almost 
pitiful trials mm. in which a few people were accused, endless uh, uh, trial, uh, uh, process, procedures went on. You think uh, even in, the, in Germany, the whole notification was quite superficial. So there's no backlash here. If, if, you, if your story is war, not if you are a journalist writing about it. Yeah. I'd like to um, bring it up another issue, a little bit tangential to what we have just been talking about. Women in war. Uh, and I regret that there's not a, uh, a woman on this uh, panel. Yeah. Um, I would gladly have given my place. Uh, but um, so uh, there's a wonderful book for those who are interested in this topic called uh, War and Gender by a political scientist named Joshua Goldstein. And uh, one of the many really valuable pieces of information in that book was that uh, women account for fewer than 1% of uh, actual uh, combat soldiers uh, through human history. And you know, even today, although there are many uh, more women in uh, the U.S. Army and Israel and, and uh, some other countries that they are uh, very rarely in actual combat. It's usually accidental when that, that happens. Um, and so the question is whether war is really exclusively a male problem and if so, how, uh, what cultural, social changes, political changes can happen that would uh, change that empowerment of women and so forth. But I just want to read you a quote from Richard Wrangham, uh, Demonic Males, the Harvard anthropologist. Uh, he talks about female complicity in warfare in a really interesting way. This is how women uh, perpetuate war, according to Wrangham. Many women would prefer it otherwise, but in the real world, the tough guy finds himself besieged with female admirers while the self-effacing friend sadly clutches his glass of Chablis at the fern bar alone. <laughs> I love that quote. Um, so the idea is that uh, it's not just sort of natural selection that has produced tough, ambitious, warlike men. It's sexual selection that is also contributed it. So I just am sort of throwing this out there. I assume this will come up again in the Q&A. Um, but who would like to? So the, sort of two things, how women contribute to the war and how, how women can contribute to uh, peace. Well, there's a lot there. So uh, make it short uh, pieces. <laughs> Um, two really interesting examples of having to do with this are Dahomey, the Kingdom of Dahomey in Africa, the West mm -hmm. African coast in the early 19th century, mm -hmm. and Eritrea uh, in the past 10 years or so on the other side of Africa. Both had women warriors, um, co combatants, uh, went into combat on purpose uh, in Dahomey and gender specific units. They were the shock troops, um, and they vanquished male armies they went up against. In Eritrea, uh, these were mixed units, which were called back into service just a couple of years ago when there was another flare-up. It shows that biologically, women certainly can be warriors. I mean, those two cases and others, but those are two ones that show in terms of biology, in terms of uh, uh, emotional biology, they can do it. In both cases, they couldn't be women, though. Uh, the Dahomey Amazons declared that they were men. They had become men. They, by fiat of the king, could not marry, so they were not in domestic units. Eventually, they were wiped out by uh, invading armies from Europe, so we don't know what would have happened in the long term. Uh, but they couldn't fit into the female role. In Eritrea, which is still going on now, all these women who went out to fight, and there was a very radical uh, uh, left philosophy, anti-family, anti-woman subjugation, uh, excelled on the battlefield, um, came back home, couldn't get along, couldn't get married, couldn't get along with their husbands, had to kind of expunge their role in the war in order to fit in. What you see there is that uh, a woman, in terms of gender roles in those societies, could not be a warrior. Biologically, they could be, but they couldn't in terms of the society's gender roles. That's one thing. Uh, Rangham's thing. Uh, it's often said that women love warriors, uh, and some do, uh, man in uniform and all that stuff. Uh, we also don't, there's been one case that supposedly showed that uh, males, the Anamami, male warriors had more uh, offspring, more wives and more offspring than 
than those who were the lovers, not in the fern bar. Uh, Just but tell people who the Yanomami are. This is a very Yanomami, important yeah. tribe in the history of uh, the discussion over the roots of war. The Yanomami are large. Uh, ethnic group on the border of Brazil and Venezuela, uh, made famous in work by Napoleon Chagnon. Uh, the type case uh, for theories of the anthropology and war in many ways. And one of the studies purported to show that um, killers uh, had three times as many children as non-killers. Well, that's been completely falsified again and again, been falsified for 20 years. But it's in a book that I just got in the mail this week. It keeps coming out again and again. Um, and what you see is that the killers get killed early. Uh, so even if they are having more wives, uh, they die earlier. And so their reproductive success is dramatically curtailed. Um, Wrangham also was the basis, and this is the last point, uh, Francis Fukuyama took demonic males. And uh, Wrangham in an interview said that this was really, his, his was basically a feminist position that if the world was run by women, it would be a better place for all of us. Um, but it's not run by women. So we proposed, like in England, there would be uh, a male, like a house of lords and a house of ladies. You know, there would be, <laughs> there would be a, a female house, and that would act as a check on the aggressive drives of men. Francis Fukuyama took this and said, well, this shows that feminizing our foreign policy, in his word, getting women in political positions, will make us weak in a world of these demonic males who are out there. And so we do that at our own peril. Um, and when he talked at the Council of Foreign Relations, somebody said, what about Golda Meir? What about Indira Gandhi? What about Margaret Thatcher? And the answer was always, well, there's exceptions. Um, so I'll stop it. Thank you. But Dalmi, by the way, was a great slaving kingdom, too. Mm -hmm. one of the That's one of the reasons why they went that way. Slave empire. Mm -hmm. that, that yep. had to be. I, the answer to this may be in Euripides, the Trojan women, but I, I, I don't know. <laughs> Isn't one of the, the ways to, that this is explained, the Chablis story, <laughs> is that the woman is, has to protect her offspring. Um, and she would therefore like to have a man or men around her who are capable of protecting the offspring instead of just sipping Chablis all day. Right. Well, the, uh, the evolutionary psychologist would say that there's just the emotional attraction, but then there is this rational calculation that's actually taking place at a subconscious level <coughs> through eons of evolution. But it's just manifested as desire. Let me add a small vignette here. And that has to do with what I think is a tradition in the Israeli army, that uh, women, maybe today it's different, were not paratroopers. But it was only women who were functioning as folding the parachute. Men were not trusted to be caring and exact enough and have the patience to do so. Because if you don't fold the parachute perfectly, he doesn't open when you jump. Um, all right, so another... Uh, if I was a paratrooper, I'd be glad that's the way they did it, I guess. <laughs> another uh, topic. Um, so we, we mentioned uh, William James, moral subs uh, equivalent of war before, and the idea that James was exploring was whether uh, there are uh, relatively benign ways for us to get the war impulse out of our system. So James's uh, proposal was that young men, men, uh, be enlisted in a war against nature. I think that was his phrase. And the way that that uh, that he meant that was that men would have um, uh, sort of dangerous jobs out in the wild, as fishermen or miners or loggers and things like that. And CCC. Pardon me. He was anticipating the CCC. Yes, the, right. The work organization of the New Deal. Yeah. And um, so then and Conrad Lorenz <laughs> in uh, On Aggression had a similar discussion, but he focused mainly on sports. So I think it's sort of, a, you know, the idea is that uh, it's a kind of Freudian idea that there's this built up uh, sort of uh, a desire to vent our aggression in these various ways. And we just need to have healthy outlets for that. So I wonder if you find that at all plausible. Dory. Um, we, uh, 
Clinton buzz. And so, okay. Yeah. So football as a moral equivalent of war. Right. The History Channel as a moral equivalent of war. <laughs> Who knows? It's I mean, sort of a, an empirical it, question. Yeah. I mean, if you have a society with more violent contact sports, for example, would you expect that to be a more peaceful uh, society? Well, that was tested in anthropology by the mm. HRAF statistics, which is this data set. Um, Lorenz's idea was tested. And societies that have more combat-like games have more war. More war. More war. Interesting. Okay. I just want to say my uh, personal story. I have a 15-year-old son who is um, obsessed with all things military. He loves to play the uh, first-person uh, shooter games video games, which are now incredibly realistic. And he's actually gotten into a sport called airsoft. You've probably heard of uh, paintball. Where, well, according to my son, paintball is for sissies. Uh, you know, real tough guys play airsoft, which is um, uh, they use these plastic BBs. It started in Japan. Mm. And in, in Japan. In Japan, yeah. and you can see it there as possibly a... So much for the pacifist nation. <laughs> yes, but here... <laughs> But here in the States, my son plays these war games with up to 40, 50 other people, most of them men. And the odd thing is that most of them are actual combat veterans. Some of these guys are coming from Iraq and Afghanistan, have just been fighting over there. Their idea of fun is to come here and still be shooting other people except with... Uh, what do you shoot them with? I mean, what, I, you shoot them with these guns with uh, these little plastic BBs, which are the guns are incredibly accurate. So I think this totally destroys Lorenz's idea of um, sports and war games as being some kind of cathartic, uh, healthy uh, outlet for the uh, war instinct. Does it do anything to Brian's idea? Hmm? Which? This. That, um, which that, I'm not that following. Spontaneously, a 15-year-old is interested in going uh, doing this war game. I, I think it is spontaneous. Uh, in someone I've heard on a couple of occasions, people say, um, my son, uh, we never let him play with war toys, but now anything that's longer than it is wide becomes a gun. Um, and, or something like that. But um, in our evolutionary past, there were no guns. Uh, if he's making everything into a gun, it's because he's learned about guns somehow. There's no other way for him to do that. And if he's learned about guns, he's also learned that guns is a, a grown-up male thing. Guns is a guy thing. So even though so we're not teaching our son to do this, you are. And the socialization takes place at such an early level. I mean, this, this difference of gender of male-female is uh, uh, very, it, it goes, there's one study that is continually referred to which works at preschool, but, but gender socialization takes place before that. There's a case of Baby X where they, um, there was a jack-in-a-box uh, and uh, they showed film of a baby crying when a, when a, uh, a jack-in-a-box popped up and they showed it to people and asked, and the baby started to cry when a jack in box popped up and they asked people who watched that, why is a baby crying? And when they were told that they didn't know what sex the baby really was, when they were told it was male, it's, they said it was because it was angry. And when they were told it was a girl, they said it was uh, because it was frightened. Um, or when they're put in a room with a baby and they've got different toys to give them, told it's a boy, they give them a ball or a football, and told it's a girl to give them a doll. And this happens very, very early on. This happens before we start seeing, you know, you, you see these things. You, you, when my daughter was applying to, to preschool, um, we, we were going into, going into uh, one of the schools which will remain uh, nameless. And she was talking about the, the boys, uh, and they're just so much more aggressive. And he, she says, it's just that uh, testosterone. Well, boys and girls have the same amount of testosterone until puberty. It's not testosterone that's doing it, but we think it is. What, 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 uh, John, you know, in your initial, when you asked everyone to raise their hand, you know, and, I, and I raised my hand and said, well, I thought that war might, you know, I was one of the people who was thinking that maybe that war would end. I didn't mean, I think it depends on how you define human beings. Uh, that is to say, are human beings, are creatures uh, which exist in a materialized form, or, you know, like I have this whole theory of consciousness is that the human race may perpetuate itself in a cybernetic level after we've, we've totally eradicated the, uh -oh. the, the, the organic state. But what I'm trying to say is, it, it's, it's, it runs, it's contravention to what you've just said in a strange way. That there's a difference between acting in a virtual reality and in reality, and, and what is that difference? Materialization. We haven't really dealt with the economics of war. Good, good question. Um, yes, resources. So there's been this debate 
that's played out in uh, the whole question of the origins of war over whether really it is biology and there are sort of different biological theories or environmental causes and probably the most popular environmental uh, explanation through time has been uh, that it's war is generally some sort of Malthusian process where there are too many people and uh, too few resources so you inevitably get conflict. So there's a book that came out a few years ago, I know Brian has written about this, called uh, Constant Battles by a, a Harvard archaeologist named uh, Stephen LeBlanc. Um, and he's, uh, you know, he, he says that this, uh, you can see this pattern, for example, in North America uh, before uh, Europeans arrived with fight of Indians over various big game. And uh, so it's not just humans fighting each other, but it's also humans in, in uh, disequilibrium with nature. So I think there's this idea of the, the peaceful, noble, savage living uh, in harmony with each other, but also uh, having a kind of equilibrium with nature and not taking more than they can use and so forth. That's been totally shattered, I think. Brian, you can correct me if I'm wrong. Over the last two decades or so, which has shown that North American Indians uh, destroyed many species, overhunted, and really uh, ruined a lot of uh, ecosystems. So it's not necessarily, if you shift to an environmental explanation of this kind, it's not necessarily going to make you more optimistic about the future, especially since we're facing the possibility of, of uh, oil wars, more oil wars, I should say. We've had a few already. Yes. <laughs> uh, wars over water. That could be the next great uh, uh, scarce resource. So I, you know, I'll sort of throw this out. Um, resources as the main source of conflict in the future. Well, well, well I'll just chime in that for a time, of course, many of you, I, I suspect, grew up reading Charles Beard, uh, yeah. the great economic interpretation of everything in American history. And he was a great historian, 1920s, 30s, 40s. Um, it still has impact. Then after World War II, and, and, and Beard, of course, interpreted the American Civil War as just and nothing else but a clash of two kinds of economies. Mary, too, right? Mary, exactly. Charles and Mary Beard wrote The Rise of American Civilization, 1927. Thank you. Um, and then came World War II, the reemergence of ideology in American historiography and our discovery of race and the entire reinterpretation of slavery. And Beard was just put away for two generations, although I at least read him in graduate school. But Beard, Beardian interpretations, that is, that all things are essentially determined by material condition and economics, is making a comeback. Uh, the, 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 I don't think it's an entirely persuasive comeback. Um, but the American Civil War, for example, is once again being interpreted uh, as, look, the result of uh, the total hegemony of cotton production on the American economy. Uh, and if you look at nothing but the numbers, it's quite compelling. The slaves were worth three, three and a half billion dollars in 1860, by far the largest financial asset in the entire American economy, worth more than all manufacturing, all railroads, and everything else put together except the land. And you can, you can take that argument uh, and, and just follow it wherever you want to go, and suddenly there is no ideology. There's just forces in history. So. Uh, in a sense, the Civil War was a resource war because everyone was competing for control of the American West and what kind of labor system would exist there and so forth. Um, I, I, I think that's too deterministic, but God knows if this recession, cum, depression lasts long enough, we may be all Beardians again. Right. I hope not. Well, I, I, I would, I'm going to take this opportunity here because... Um, uh, when I say, said be, before that the, this focus on aggression is, is kind of a, a diversion from what? So this is the from what, I think. Uh, this is what, um, I've been studying war for about 30 years now. I know I don't look that old. But, um, <laughs> and, so you, but tell me anyway. Uh, and it's, when you make a generalization about war, across the board, it's of course going to have lots of exceptions. But basically, this is my generalization, that wars, wars occur when the people who make the decisions to fight believe it is in their pro 
their practical self-interest to start the fighting. Well, often they turn out to be wrong. They believe that at the time. Um, this means that if you're looking at war, to try to understand war, you should be asking who is making the decisions. Sometimes that's simple, sometimes it's complicated. You look at what are their interests, their practical interests, the resources at their disposal, the costs of them, safety, and very much their position within the internal structure of a society. This is very different from standard approaches to war. I think uh, when you say war is a cont continuation of policy by other means, politics by other means, domestic politics by other means, from the Yanomami campfire uh, to the White House uh, in uh, a few years ago. I think that domestic politics are key. Leaders have different interests than other people in society. Sometimes they are opposed to each other. Um, generalization, not always true, and I want to emphasize that. They're, it's not always true, but generally, leaders favor war because war favors leaders. Leaders have, a, have a, can gain in their position within their own society, the resources, the power at their disposal, if the war works out the way they think it's going to work. But they don't talk about those interests in those way to the public because no one would go to die for somebody else's interests. They always do what I call moral conversion. They take their chosen course of action and find the highest applicable moral values, whether that is promoting democracy or avenging witchcraft. And they phrase it in those terms and they promulgate that to get followers. But also, I believe, they come to see it themselves that way, to avoid cognitive dissonance. And this, I think, is one of the reasons why people are so dangerous. Because you come to believe what's, what you want is your right. It's the moral thing to do, even if it involves killing other people. And it's always the other side. This is, this is the practical universal. It's the other side that started it, or brought it on somehow. Um, so that's what I would say is where you go if you want to understand war. And that's why talking about evolved natures, I think, takes us in the wrong direction. Well, this finally gets us to, to, the, to the idea of how you mobilize whole societies yeah. for war. Mm -hmm. and, you, and most wars do be, uh, that last very long do become cosmological. It's good and evil. Mm -hmm. uh, you, need, you need an argument to mobilize people, uh, which reminds us again and again, as I always remind my students, uh, why wars happen. That, that story of immediate and long-term causation is not at all the same question Correct. about as why individual people go fight mm -hmm. or why a man goes and fights. Why the war happened, why a soldier is where he is are two very different questions. Mm -hmm. now, I face this all the time. If you study the American Civil War and you talk about its memory and aftermath, you constantly hear this question, this point that the average Southern man never fought to preserve slavery. He was only preserving his home, or, or and so on. Yes, okay. But why that war came about is not the same question as why that man was out there in the field following Robert E. Lee wherever he went. So we're getting close to Q and A. I would, I would um, like to end this part uh, of the session on, uh, I hope, uh, an upbeat note. I want to ask, <coughs> get a sense of what your greatest hope for peace might be. I'll just toss out a couple um, that uh, are bandied about. Um, one is the notion of a, a single world government. So Einstein, Bertrand Russell, this is very popular, uh, especially after um, uh, World War I. Uh, you don't hear it quite as often nowadays, but the, you know, the UN, League of Nations, were formed with uh, this in mind that um, that you could have a, a global governance that would uh, would uh, avoid warfare. Uh, another popular uh, idea, Bruce Russett at Yale um, has promoted this, is uh, democratic peace. Uh, it was Kant actually first came up with the idea that that uh, democracies are less likely to fight each other than uh, non-democracies, and this empirically has stood up pretty well. Um, and then there is uh, female um, empowerment. There's an anthropologist named Mel Connor who actually told me the single most important thing you can do to reduce conflict, especially in the developing world, is to educate girls. Because then you get a lower birth rate. Uh, you get um, less stress on the resources uh, of that country. Um, you generally get a more uh, benign government. You expect more women to go into the workforce and into politics and so forth. So there are all these good effects that 
uh, cascade from educating girls in third world countries. But anyway, um, Dory, I just wonder if you have, if there's a, any idea that you sort of would pin your hopes on for, um, sorry to be so, yeah. you know, no, no. cosmic. I, but. but I cannot choose one of your the okay. options you get. I think what is very striking is the uh, blindness during war, the simply refusal to know. Uh, anywhere from the Munich Pact, when things were evident and Chamberlain was rescuing the world, and it needed a powerful, intelligent, committed media and responsive public to perhaps at that moment to start to stop the flow. Right. Uh, the bombing of the railroads to the gassing. Uh, it would have taken one half day of the uh, um, air resources to be dedicated to completely destroy the camps. But to do so would have meant to acknowledge their gas chambers, to acknowledge their camps, which was known. But, not, uh, but uh, uh, by not acting, you didn't know. Right. You Media, a response of the public. I don't think that FDR had to wait for um, the uh, uh, invasion, for uh, the bombing of Pearl Harbor in order to start the war. Mm -hmm. There was enough re knowledge and reason to stay for the United States to the war earlier. Mm -hmm. We all heard on television about what was going on in Rwanda. And uh, nothing. I mean, resolutions, endless debates. I think a powerful in Kofi Annan slapping on the wrist that they made too much noise afterwards. And then getting the Nobel Peace uh, Prize. Mm -hmm. I think we need a leadership, a, a, a citizen leadership in reflected in uh, voices in the media which are very responsible and not for, uh, going after the excitement and what this is uh, sensational. But that leaves us with moral suasion against a media that is driven by profit and by cable, by 24-hour cable television. And there's some very bright people on cable television, but there's, they're, they're, they speak in formulas and so on. I mean, I don't know how I would vote on your multiple choice question if I had to vote, but what, a, what an interesting referendum that would make, or a poll, a, a poll would make. Uh, maybe, maybe your third one, but I'd add to that uh, a, a more de democratization of education for everyone, not just women. And, I mean, this sounds so idealistic, but and and maybe the global economy and global communication will somehow lead to something resembling more global government. Although, God, that doesn't have an encouraging history, but. A democratization of education to some extent where we can imagine, this seems so idealistic for me. I'm, I'm a pessimist. The history makes me a pessimist. But, but um, That's why I try to learn as little as possible. There you go. It's a danger, you know. It, it, history ought to teach you a sense of tragedy, if not pessimism. But, but, you know, how many wars can we go back and reconstruct that we got into just by ignorance? What do we know about Southeast Asia when we went into <laughs> Vietnam? We didn't even understand its history with China. What do we know about the history of Iraq before we invaded it? And on and on and on we go. Every, uh, we point to any one war, you, any war you want, and you can reconstruct its origins out of a certain kind uh, of American ignorance. Uh, so, um, you know, God, maybe a democratization of education uh, much more broadly that, that teaches a skepticism. But I'd also say this, you know, some, in some ways we historians are the culprits. Uh, we, the, the social history won the revolution in history. Uh, and to some extent, the profession stopped studying politics and war and diplomacy to a degree. And we never stopped. Um, but we have whole half of whole departments now that actually have nothing to do with teaching about war diplomacy or politics. And there's a danger in that. It turns out students still want to know. They, they take these courses. You put war in the title of a course, you get hundreds of students. What does that tell us? Maybe that's your 15-year-old finally arriving you know, as a freshman. I don't know. Uh, but I suspect it's much more than that because they realize the world's full of this. Yes. So I'm, I'm for democratization of education. How we do that in other countries, I don't know. But in terms of education... Rev up the Fulbright program. What about the Falklands War? I mean, those were too educated. Oh, yeah. Yeah. 
Well, we're an educated society, reasonably. <laughs> uh, uh, well, I mean, sure. Well, Germany was a, a, a tremendously educated society. Japan was an educated society. Educated societies have made war as readily as anybody else. Um, well, um, and then we'll open it up to questions. Yeah. Uh, I, I would just, uh, as a little footnote there to what was just being discussed, uh, all these wars through ignorance, I would say take a look at the domestic politics. Sure. That's where I would look. But anyway, um, anthropologists have thought about this elimination of war. This brings us back to the beginning. They thought about the elimination of war for over a century. Boaz talked about it, some kind of an, a, a global government. Uh, Malinowski, global government, abolition of the nation state. The problem when you talk about global government is that uh, you can get there by global conquest and what kind of government you're going to have. Right. Um, the Another way to look at it is a kind of uh, developing organic integration as we saw in Europe. I mean, nobody in 1935 uh, or 1940 or 45 even could have foreseen what Europe has become today. It doesn't mean it's not reversible. It could yeah. reverse. Uh, but w what we've seen is this progressive, the anthropologists from Boaz on have said, if you look at the history of the world, you see progressively larger uh, societies with peace within them. And that's not talking about 100 years, it's talking about 10,000 years. And so if you think 1,000 years in the future, I don't see a likelihood of this happening to encompass places like uh, Congo today. But I think it's necessary to envision it. I think not only can we, but we must envision a, a world without war because to get there, one of the things that has to happen is people have to change their minds about war. And they have to see war as something that is not inevitable. We'll have to live with it, our children, our grandchildren. Um, but there are steps that can be taken at lots of different levels to impede leaders when they want to push toward war, uh, that can develop connections uh, across boundaries that can be militarized. Um, there's a whole anthropological field called the study of peace, and it's different from the study of war because the things that lead to peace are, are not the same things that lead to war, and we have to pay attention to that. We don't study peace. Uh, we don't even have a word to say pieces over time. Uh, we can talk about wars all the time, and we have to valorize that idea of looking at it as a possibility for the future uh, to maybe take steps that we can, baby steps, we can take now to, to make it uh, come about sooner. Great. John, Thanks, you know, just before the arc, yeah. our, que our questions come, uh, you know, everyone knows the Aristophanes play in which the women refuse to have sex, you know. Yes, so, so, yeah, you David, know. Uh, David mentioned it earlier. Yeah. Uh, the, 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 is there some significance, and I wish, uh, uh, you know, it add to, uh, you know, to the fact that... That would that be your it, idea? No, no, that, that, that would be not my idea. That's too precious a commodity. <laughs> but I think it's significant that even we take it in a facetious note that the, that the, the play between sex and war is, is brought up in that, in that particular context. Because, right. You know, Eros and Agape, I guess. Well, it. actually, I, I, I should say, because it's something I've, I've thought about little, is that there was, so, and uh, Margaret Mead yeah. and uh, Coming of Age in Samoa sort of had an inverse relationship between um, violence and sex. So the idea was that the uh, the more sex you had, the more un uninhibited sex you had, the less violent you would be. So this is a kind of Freudian I cathartic true, yeah. notion. Um, but that is just flat out <laughs> wrong. And so, so among the Yanomamo, for example, uh, there was more, uh, I think, uh, according to Chagnon, and, uh, the anthropologist who has studied them and maybe a suspect source somewhat, there's a positive correlation between sexual activity and uh, violence. Yeah, but the, I think the, the connection is more that it's very hard to have violence when you have loving feelings. Not yes. just sex, but loving feelings. Right. That loving feelings are the best antidote against the more destructive feelings. Except then the, uh, the counter to that is that it's what Freud said, the, the Freud quote that, yeah, lots of love in the group, but then out for people outside the group, yeah. you have lots of aggression. So. Von Clausewitz said, war is the continuation of politics by other means. Hmm. That was in the 19th century, probably the earliest, early part of the 19th century. And by politics, he also meant economics, I would tend to think. And certainly, Lenin felt that way, and certainly Marx and all the rest. Um, um, can you find any examples, Mr. Blight, uh, where this wasn't so? 
I mean, you mentioned slavery and you mentioned beard, but I would tend to think that others could see the causes with slavery being met probably, possibly, probably the main cause, and yet there were other causes, of course, states' rights, et cetera, et cetera. And I really do tend to agree with Dr. Ferguson about what he said, you know, that, that, that you know, it's something they throw out there with this uh, aggression. I mean, not that we aren't uh, aggressive and not that we aren't uh, uh, programmed to be a certain way and only take consciousness, political consciousness, not to. And I wonder why in this politics, which is primary, uh, economics is not a part of politics, which it certainly is. So can you make some comments on that? And thank you very much. It was very interesting. And you took the words out of my mouth. It took a long time, starting up with uh, Mr. Levy, with the economics factor, which hadn't even been mentioned right. until that point. Mm -hmm. Not next time, please. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'm not sure which question to answer, but um, I would say this. From Clausewitz, well, OK, politics. Is war, is war only politics by other means? As long, I think he's, he's dead right. Uh, as long as we don't take that word politics and say that politics only means partisanship, right. that it's not about anything, that it's issueless, uh, we, we tend to do that. I mean, my own students tend to have that attitude. Politics means there's no substance there. Politics means it's people fighting for power. They're dividing up power. They're bending wills, but it's not over anything. Now, and I'll just say one other thing here to go back to your beard question, yes. economics versus ideas, or however we want to shape that question. There was a whole school of American historiography about the Civil War. Some of you read this, uh, led by James G. Randall, many others. They were called the Needless War School because essentially what they argued from the 1920s through the 1940s, even the 50s, was that the American Civil War was the result almost entirely not of any real issues, but of political fanaticism. They still argue. Well, yeah, the argument has never gone away. It's very beguiling. Now, wait a minute. No, there's something to it that, that, that it was simply the result of irrational partisanship, this breaking up of political parties in the 1850s, was just dividing up over power, that in the end it wasn't about anything except power in the hands. Now, there clearly is a domestic political story by which disunion comes about in America, just to use this example, in 1860-61. So Clausewitz is dead right in the sense that war is, is politics by other means. Um, and I would even say, as I, I said in my book, you know, that the, 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 the memory of war is war by other means. I mean, that's the problem with it. Uh, we, we divide up over the story. We divide up over the narrative. We fight like hell about who gets to control the story of what the war was about. And sometimes that's the deadly soil in which the next one happens. So I, I agree with Clausewitz. As long as we don't take that notion to, to, to the level of saying politics never is about anything. Uh, the Civil War broke out over something very, very real. At the same time, there were some fanatical politicians. World War II also, all of them. Sure. Who would argue World War II wasn't about something? But we can construct a, a certain ir irrationality here and there that led to that. God knows we can construct that for World War I. We have another question here. Hi, my name is Victor Miller. Um, I found this extremely interesting. Uh, what, what a few things, one or two points that weren't mentioned, is that we do know statistically, of course, that uh, uh, that the extent of war is diminishing. We haven't had any world wars, um, and I forget the name of the book that I've read about uh, about peace, the structure of peace, and uh, by a very well-known professor who, who who mentions this. Okay, and what what I what I also want to mention is that recently I've been studying the. Uh, I'm a pharmacist, but I'm interested in in in, in cancer. And when I hear this kind of talk and when I study the, what, what goes on inside our body instead of in our brain and obviously externally, I see that a tumor forms. Uh, you know, there's some sort of accident which 
Often we don't know what it was, whether it's the food we ate or some sort of radi you know, radiation we're exposed to. Uh, a tumor forms, and then some, some, it can be as little as one cell uh, breaks off from it, and can, can, they call it so, seed and soil, or you know, seed and soil. It's like a, a, a seed that goes to any other part of the body. It can travel to your liver. And uh, one of the statistics was that 90% of, um, uh, of, the, of the cancers, people die from the secondary cancers, not from the primary cancer. And what this shows me is that somehow inherent in us, you know, if it's, if it's happening within our, inside our body, you know, that isn't this the external manifestation that war, you know, they talk about a cancer in our society. Is this not, the, is this not you know, does this not give the meaning of that? And, and just a quick question, um, Professor Loeb. So, you know, I, I've lived with, uh, with Israel and Palestine since I was 14 years old. And, you know, finally, recently, I've come to an answer, a guy called Rafi Netz Zengut and Professor Bartal, from Tel Aviv University, have written about the nature of the Israeli. You know, uh, they did a survey and they found the Israelis were aggressive, uh, didn't have sympathy for the Palestinians, uh, et cetera, et cetera, all kind of negatives. And all my life, I've never been able to figure out how a people, uh, I'm Jewish myself, how our people could have endured the Holocaust and then gone on to visit these in iniquities on, on another community. And I'm not saying, you know, I don't want to bring up the politics of it. It's just, it's just so disconcerting for me. Sorry if I've taken too long. Very good question. Which one? Yeah, it is, it is very disconcerting. Um, I think we still need to uh, pay attention to a specific situation. Uh, I, I wouldn't. Uh, I rec we recently were in London and it, it, it encountered a rally against the Gaza operation. Right. And the banners, also carried by members of the Ture Karta, that's an ultra religious group of Jews living in Jerusalem, was stop the Holocaust in Gaza. I think that is, I should have said to them this is blasphemy. The, Gaza is Gaza in its uh, torture, but the Holocaust is not Gaza, and Gaza is not the Holocaust. On your statistics notion, I, I don't know. We can numbers are numbers. We can always debate numbers, but I'm not so sure it's a cause for optimism. And the, what is the figure now in the 20th century of people who died in war? I mean, I've heard there, it's, it's well in excess of 200 million. It's about. Uh, that's it's slightly right? more than 200 million, and that's it's the most violent century in all of human history. Um, we haven't started this century terribly well on that count. So I, um, we haven't had a you know a world war, no. But uh, the upside, though, is that uh, oh, good. this I is what uh, Lawrence Keeley has written about. <laughs> that uh, so Lawrence, there's an archaeologist, Lawrence Keeley, wrote a book called War Before Civilization, mm -hmm. and this has been a very important book. I know Brian has some disagreements with it, and sort of blowing apart the old idea of the peaceful noble savage. And he said that actually rates of violence were extraordinarily high among pre-state societies, you typically got mortality rates from violence of 25 to 50 percent. That's about an order of magnitude higher than the 20th century. So as bloody as oh, the 20th well. century was, it was <laughs> only, about, already. only about 2 percent <laughs> of the population died true. of war-related causes. The numbers so, are, yeah, yeah, you can always use statistics to have a happy, <laughs> happy ending. Well, if I could jump in just on that. <laughs> true, uh, that's not an unusual number, but it's also you have full mobilization of the adult males. Basically, everybody who's an adult male goes to fight. Right. But it also, to both questions, just say, say again about Clausewitz and about, you know, I, I don't do the Middle East, um, but uh, look at this dialectic of internal politics and uh, external politics and also layers of politics that are involved. I will take this opportunity. Um, the book that I had suggested be here um, couldn't be for merchandising reasons, the publisher. But if anyone's interested in these ideas, if you Google my name, it will take you to my departmental web page. And I've got PDF files there with all the stuff on it. So you can read till you're sick of it. But uh, it's all right there. I have a Thank question you. for Professor Blight. Uh, 
despite what you said, there are peace studies. There are several programs, quite a few actually, uh, on conflict resolution, peace studies. My husband's son teaches in one and has in three other institutions. Mm -hmm. Do you have any hope for this genre? Well, I didn't say there weren't peace studies programs. There surely are. I heard you say that, so oh. there's no word for pieces. Studies. I said that. I said oh, that. Oh, you said that? Excuse me. Uh, okay. <laughs> well, Brian, maybe you should answer this one. Uh, <laughs> peace studies programs, uh, I mean, I've been All around through a couple of waves of them, and they grow with war. Uh, during mm. the, uh, there was, Reagan was great for peace studies, uh, <laughs> and then, um, when we got uh, uh, Ford and Carter, the the peace studies groups that I was involved with were were, were falling apart uh, because people didn't feel the need to do it anymore. They thought we'd somehow reached, you know, peace until uh, the Soviets went into Afghanistan, and then it all started back up again. So peace no, studies it, are going to fall apart under Obama then. Well, if war goes away, if right. war goes away, peace studies will go away. But it, it, war war promotes peace studies, and it should, and it should. And what I was saying there is not that you know there aren't people who are working on this. Uh, it's that we need to be working on this, uh, and peace studies is a very important thing because we have to realize that peace is not it's not just the absence of war. It's a positive state that has to be understood and worked towards. And let's not forget there are all kinds of think tanks and human rights organizations that exist to do conflict resolution. There, there are foreign policy institutes that in part exist to work on conflict resolution of all kinds. Mm -hmm. None of this came up in your list of hopes. Um, oh. <laughs> well, Brian did well, mention... I talked about democratization of education. And let's have... <laughs> Ten more think tanks doing conflict resolution. I've, I've been involved in and will be involved in soon another group that's trying to find ways to um, do what I suggested to uh, avoid combat and conflict in one or one situation or globally. So it's, uh, but that's you got to work for that. You got to see that as something. You got to envision it. Hi, I'm Tyler Volkett in NYU. Uh, so I have two questions. One is a short very specific statistical question to follow up on this idea of uh, trends over time, because I get interested in large-scale trends of gross world product and CO2 and population, things like that. So, so John, you referenced this book before civilization, Ford, you know, and, yes. and you also see one sees graphs and Pinker's books about numbers of homicides in tribal societies, right, and they're really high. Yeah. Is there any good data set for, uh, you know, like deaths per year from from a war killing like per million people that you know, would actually see you know, thousands of years of, of you know, a few points at least so you could see good data on this rather than just prior to civilization in the 20th century or any... I've tried to find that and it's, in, it, you'd think yeah. that would be, there, a lot of people would want to quantify that and I've had the hardest time just trying to find something that tracks War-related casualties uh, over, let's say, over the last 500 years or 1,000 years, or you know. So what I just said previously was a gross comparison of war before civilization to the 20th century, and that just came from this one book. Mm -hmm. But uh, this whole area of trying to come up with uh, measures of of uh, casualties over time, and then obviously, then you could look for correlates of war and peace. Right. But I so, mean, you, so you haven't seen it. I haven't. I haven't found it. I, I don't yeah. think. I, I know it doesn't exist, and I, it, the problem for coming up with it is that it rests on some very hotly disputed assumptions about the nature of war in the past. Um, there is one school of thought that takes war as witnessed within the past 500 years by explorers and anthropologists and says, okay, look at those levels of combat, and we can project that into 10,000 years ago. And I've said that you can't do that. Mm -hmm. the, the archaeological remains show that that's simply not the case. The skeletal mm -hmm. remains are very clear that it's not the case. Mm -hmm. um, and if you try to understand, if you, if you look at the question of how much war there is in relationship to some kind of theory as to why wars occur, the circumstances that lead to more war as you go forward in time aren't there earlier on. But other people like Larry Keeley or, or uh, Stephen LeBlanc disagree with that. So if they're going to come up with a completely different estimate than I would come up with. Mm -hmm. just, just as a side point, there, it, it's extraordinarily diff difficult just to get a figure of Iraqi deaths 
mm -hmm. uh, since the U.S. invasion. That's, mm -hmm. I mean, as I'm sure everybody knows. Accounting. Yeah, that, so, um, and I think, and you know, imagine uh, applying that problem to, you know, all of human history. It's mm -hmm. empirically, it's, it's really difficult. Mm -hmm. Well, and this goes back to Professor Lobb's question about specifics, too, and I'll just throw one number out for you. I, it, it doesn't answer your question, but if you, because scale matters here historically. If you take the number of dead in the American Civil War, a little over 600,000, and you put it ahead to the Vietnam era in America, about four million Americans would have died. I use that with students just to get their attention uh, because, you know, we have to ask, would four million Americans die in any war? Would we sustain anything if we kill that many Americans? That's the scale of death in the American Civil War per capita. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and then, and then the, the sort of the conceptual question. Brian is spinning out a, an, a, a large-scale concept. If I try to paraphrase it, maybe get some responses to the veracity of it. That that I, I think you're seeing war as a as an emergence as, a, as an emergence out of a collective. Uh, it's 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 emergent property of a collective action, which which tends to be cooperative at root mm -hmm. over over human history. You know, with the 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 tendency to uh, help each other, but then that yes. cooperativity gets taken over by individuals or, or small groups of individuals in a leadership position that are they're going to use the cooper uh, cooperativity for their own means. Well, uh, ends. I mean. he agreed, um, but with uh, an important clarification is that when you uh, look at uh, the ethnographic universe, um, there are societies that have m much more and less developed leadership. Uh, Yanomami have very limited leadership. No one can tell another man to go to war. The, the closest you could get is a father-in-law to a son-in-law, and even he doesn't have to go. Um, but people try to manipulate. Uh, they talk. They say, you're a coward if you don't go. Uh, or you, we're obligated to avenge uh, this killing that we now know was due to witchcraft by them. Um, so they persuade, and there's some very good work in New Guinea on this too, but they can't order people to do something. Or there's limits to their persuasion. Uh, and uh, people, if they don't agree with it, can vote with their feet by not going along with that leader uh, or leaving them when they go to war. Um, as leadership, and this takes a long time in, in human history, it's when you start getting up to what we would call chiefdoms, which are approaching the level of the state, only then that do you really begin to get leaders who can give orders to go out and fight, or else we'll kill you. Um, and even in those things, you get complications. So it's not, it's usually not somebody like uh, uh, an absolute emperor who just his whim is what everybody has to do. But through most of human history, I think you do have leaders who have their own interests uh, and have an ability to persuade other people, but there's a, it's a very limited ability. Th then we might say to, to get to peace, uh, if this is true, let's, let's, let's assume it's true for a second, that means we're going to have to change the structure of leadership, or that might be one more deduction horizontal. one could have. Huh? Well, more horizontal. Well, more this, horizontal. Is where, this is where the democratic peace theory uh, comes in. Mm -hmm. So, by women. Mm -hmm. right. And, yes. and yet we still have a country today that's highly democratized, and we, but we have one man, one, you know, one leader who can say, you know, make it so, mm -hmm. and go right. to war. Mm -hmm. Right. right. I, mean, we, I mean, we think of ourselves as, we're, we're not very horizontal. I mean, we still, even, you know, Obama, no matter who's there, mm -hmm. uh, it's still a single person, you know, in a sense, presiding over hundreds of millions. I think we're moving in the right direction, though. Yeah. <laughs> More democracy. Yes. More democracy. That's a, well, that's, well, go ahead. Okay. That's sort of a nice segue to, to what I was going to talk about, which is, um, nobody mentioned, or maybe mentioned it briefly, um, the biological basis of altruism. Yeah. And, and, um, yeah, Brian got into a little bit. Just briefly, and, and I want to expand on it more. There's a book called Non Zero by Robin Wright, and, and it basically it posits that, that over time we've seen progress. Despite all the, if you look at the 20th century and all, for all the bloodshed, for all the 200 million who were killed, we still made huge societal pro progress globally. 
all over the world, disease and in, in education, in, in standard of living, in everything. Women's rights. Women's rights, all kinds of rights. Um, over the over that, so over the long arc of history, we still make progress. So the question is, is that in spite of war, or because, or is or that other thing that you touched on before is war, the the genesis? Uh, all right. That's a terrific Bar. book. I, Robert Wright is a friend of mine. He's actually got a chapter that addresses your question directly. I recommended it about a thousand times. He'll be very happy. Um, so the he's got a chapter titled uh, "War: What Is It Good For?" and uh, and it talks about um, societies, very warlike societies, as um, developing some of these methods of cooperation and technologies that, uh, as a result of that, um, and all these sort of tools of civilization that are applied to aggression and warfare, but that can also be used for globalization and for a larger coming together of people. Uh, the one problem I have with Wright's book is that it, it, there's a kind of whiff of determinism about it. And um, uh, of course, you know, we could have a nuclear exchange between India and Pakistan or, you know, the, things could just, there's no determinism at all in human history and politics, I think. And so I, I hate any kind of positive determinism because it relieves us of the responsibility to fight for peace constantly. Just to say something from the psychoanalytic side, uh, you quoted uh, from the uh, civilization is discontents. There's this other thing that Freud responded to Einstein about why war. And uh, one of the reasons why he thought you could never stop war was because he felt there was a progress in civilization. But he felt that progress in civilization implied taming of what he believed were the two main instinct, instincts in humans, namely aggression and uh, sexuality, libido. And so he felt that in order to really tame them, then you would also be taming the sexual instinct, which would essentially then be the end of... Such a pessimist, isn't it? Freud, <laughs> <laughs> Freud's throwing to the <laughs> Hopelessly broad question. Just, just like it took economics a long while to come up yes. in our discussion, we, we haven't really even talked about the notion of modernity and what, because I keep thinking about what changed when we had the modern nation state mm -hmm. and nation states began to conscript soldiers, mm -hmm. not just send them to war, but conscription is a pretty modern thing. And then modernity and the nation state changed the whole relationship of governments to individuals. How we memorialize the dead soldier has all changed in 200 years, I mean, in a small amount of time in the history of human evolution. And now lots of people are claiming, I don't buy it, that we're living in a post-national era now, post-nation state era. There are a lot of nations out there making war right now. Uh, and we got more nations after 1989 than we had before. So I'm not convinced yet we're in a post-national era. But we got to think in those terms too, the modern nation state changed the game on so much of this. Um, there's well, a generalization. I think we have two more questions, but before we uh, end today, also I wanted to, uh, Miguel, who does the video, he asked, it, are there, would people here, just as a general question, would anyone be interested in, in, in purchasing at any point DVDs of, of, like, for instance, a talk like today? Are, are people interested in DVDs of these matters? If you do, raise your hand, because we just want to see if that, because we were thinking of... One, two, three, four. Okay, Miguel, that's your answer. We've about three or four interests. You were already here. You know, whether or not um, <laughs> educational institutions, universities, right. would be, and they are the people likely to actually buy the DVD. Okay, we were curious if that's worth our citizens. pursuing. Okay, uh, who's next? Thank you. Um, I feel somewhat self-conscious about what I'm about to say because I understand that war is unacceptable, Venus. One of my earliest memories is, as a child, just short of five, coming out of a movie with my parents in Chicago, and the headline was, Japs Bomb Pearl Harbor. And I remember my father turning to my mother and me. We were both refugees from Hitlerian Europe. And my father said to me, thank God. Now America will go to war. Mm -hmm. So my question is simply, is there such a thing as a just war? Mm -hmm. 
Yes. <laughs> absolutely. Perhaps Dr. Yeah. Lowe, could you elaborate on that? You said absolutely. Well, I would have agreed very much with your father. And I said this before, that the United States would have entered the war. And there are moments in history that you see something growing. And it's imperative that you open your mind to know this is, this is really so. The Hitler, the Hutu training in Cambodia, you, you see it coming. And usually it's met by denial. But I refuse to know. And until it's too late, and then it, a massive war is needed. If there were an early response, it could have been nipped in the bud. Uh, we young man here. Yes, uh, Michael Sachs. Uh, my my comment is stimulated by the questioner from NYU, okay. who was talking about the Iraq War and how, in effect, one man in the United States government led us into the war. And it's also more broadly related to Professor Ferguson's comment about the nature and influence of leadership. I just want to remind everybody that in the Constitution of the United States, the power <laughs> to declare war rests not with our executive, but with the Congress of the United States. And I would suggest perhaps uh, the founders in their contemplation of the future of the United States uh, might have had something else in mind that the, than the way in which the United States has entered into many of the wars in which we've been a party. Absolutely. I just have to add that George Bush didn't do it alone. He had a lot of help from the people who voted for him the second time, at least. He also had a lot of help from the media, including the New York Times, right. which really helped to make the case for weapons of mass destruction that were non-existent. So there's plenty of blame to go around in this big, wonderful democracy. One last question. Um, I, I wonder, wonder, wait, oh, oh, man, man, the gentleman deserves some end. I mean, it's, you're right. We've fought a lot of unconstitutional wars, but we haven't declared a war since World War I. As we all know, it's been nearly a century since really? we... Not World War II? Oh, World War II, excuse me. No, World War II, it was declared, Hitler declared the war. Excuse me? It was Germany declaring war in the United States. Sure, but I mean, constitutionally, we, we've only, the last two wars we declared were the two world wars. Hmm. And they're here again. I mean, this is a historical answer. I mean, what, what, how in the wake of World War II we got into low intensity, anti-insurgent wars, and so forth, and so forth, and so forth. The Cold War gave us a geopolitics that all but put away declarations of war forever. Now we're in the post-war era, but it seems to be the same game. At the same time, Bush got a resolution for war yeah. uh, from, from Democrats as well as Republicans. Hillary Clinton. There was a political culture that, 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 that gave him the power to make war. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't know that, that, that going back to the Constitution on this one is, is very useful, though. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we need to go back to the political culture that's allowing this, and not, the, not so much the Constitution. Seems. Um, hey, how are you? I just wondered with the with the sort Sorry. of the sort of collective uh, knowledge of history here, if you see really qualitatively different kinds of wars with really different purposes, really different cultural mm. aims, because in my limited knowledge, there seem to be wars that are sort of wars of prestige and ceremony that are kind of like your. 19th century gang fights writ large, where their purpose is to produce heroes. And then there are wars that, what we call today, total wars. Uh, and, you know, not just today, the Thirty Years' War, things like that. Do you really see throughout history a t typologies of war? Do, do people who study this think in those terms? Well, I, I don't. Uh, I, I think you certainly could construct typologies and different kinds of typologies, um, but w wars vary in so many different axes that um, it would be difficult to come up for me with some set of boxes to say put it in this box because of this thing and put it in that box because of of the other. I mean, uh, you could talk about totalitarian wars of the 20th century uh, that had. Uh, um, 
the, Malinowski did this going into World War II. He, he wrote an essay, said that we've got a new kind of war, a totalitarian war. Uh, and it's different from all the wars that have gone before, but it was clearly informed by the political situation that he was dealing with at the time. And when you look at a lot of other wars that go before, you could say, well, maybe it's not all that different. So yes, there's all kinds of variation, um, but I don't myself uh, try to separate wars into different categories. What if, but if just war exists, mm -hmm. and if, if just for the sake of argument, there, there are just wars, and we do have to talk about wars of self-defense versus wars of aggression. Well, just wars are, I mean, are something that is, yes, when somebody else attacks you and actually physically attacks you, then I think that that's a category in itself. You can say that they, they uh, and that's one of the reasons why I supported the uh, invasion of Afghanistan, for that reason. You go beyond yeah, that, too, but, you know, go beyond that to what's just wars. No, right. Uh, what is just war is, you know, I looking back, World War II, obviously yes. Um, but when, like in recent years, when I've seen in my work, the only times I, two times I've seen just war theory come up, uh, someone's argued just war theory, was when they were talking about developing new kinds in the U.S. Uh, Reaganites uh, were developing new, more flexible nuclear delivery systems. Right. Uh, and they say we have to develop new kinds of nuclear missiles mm -hmm. uh, so we can be in conformity with the tenets of just war theory. And which I thought was battlefield bizarre. nuclear weapon. Hmm? The battlefield. Battlefield, uh, and you know, so that you can what just take those? out a, a suburb rather than the city itself. And it was just a weird piece of propaganda, I thought. Right now, anthropology is facing a huge a crisis, I believe, because the Pentagon is, is trying to draw anthropology into war fighting in a way that hasn't been done ever. And it's really has the potential for transforming the entire discipline. Um, How so? The woman got killed already. Three. Uh, well, uh, a quarter of a billion dollars. To study the anthropology uh, for, for cultural, of for, tribals? Uh, for to cultural tribes. approaches to war. Quarter of a billion dollars. The anthropologists will jump through hoops for a thousand. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and Sometimes for nothing. Will come for nothing, right. Uh, <laughs> but the, one of the arguments on that side is that we, uh, it's because this is a just war, that is the, the democratically elected government has authorized it, therefore it is just for anthropologists to participate in it. And it just struck me, said, this is the second time I've ever seen just war theory coming up. So if it's a just war or not, <laughs> there's another question, is, you know, is invocation of just war uh, part of these highest applicable moral values that I say war makers always invoke. Now, well, and the Bush administration certainly drew some historians in to support their idea of preemptive war. Mm -hmm. A couple of them are my colleagues who will not be mentioned, but I'll go ahead. But uh, mm -hmm. yes, not to end on. I think that's your template. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not to end on. Uh, yep. To sci-fi a note, I just finished reading a book called uh, "Wired for War." Uh, by a uh, security analyst named Peter W. Singer. And it's about the uh, increasing use of uh, robots in war and high tech generally. So uh, a major killer of Iraqi insurgents over the last uh, five, year, five years or so are the, the drones, especially something called a Predator. Mm -hmm. Well, this thing is flying around in Iraq. The operator is at a base in Nevada. So these are guys who are there watching, looking for bad guys, pushing a button, killing them, and then they're going, um, you know, and having cocktails with their friends or going to their kid's soccer game. So um, that <laughs> is all, I mean, it's an extension of the long-range rifle and high-altitude bombing and things like that, but it's, it's a distancing of the soldier from the like effects. Like a video game. Right. Exactly I'll like a video. Take game. it one step farther. Look up global strike. This is the new Pentagon dream of being able to take out any target in the world within an hour, no matter what the target is. So this that, is this is what we're going. That's with a conventional weapon. Well, with different kinds of drones, weapons, and, drones, new weapons. You know, they you a lot of base, money, a lot of toys. You have them based in enough places mm -hmm. that you can do that. Mm -hmm. So because of technology, war keeps transforming. You think you say, okay, now we can end war. And meanwhile, war is sort of mutated into something completely different. Uh, wars against civilians, I mean, that, that has been a product of the 20th century. Right. And now we're continuing that. Oh, 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 o
our programs and a complete archive of past Philip Tatey's events is available at philiptatey's.org. 